Welcome to Cut the Bull, an insightful podcast which addresses the news of the day and the cultural issues plaguing our society, bringing logic and context to these topics and discussing solutions too real for mainstream pundits. Now, here are your hosts, Charles Love, Shamika Michelle, and Wilfred Riley. Hello and welcome to Cut the Bull. I am Charles Love, alongside my co-host Shinka Michelle and Wilford Riley. I trust you'll be here shortly. And our guest this week is Jeremy Adams. He is a high school teacher, college professor, and author of Hollowed Out, a warning about America's next generation. Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been wanting to be on for a while and uh, just what a thrill. Thank you so much. Well, I'm looking forward to the conversation. We, um, what I thought was interesting about you and your book, you know, I've read it, you know, I talk about it a lot. I tweet about it. I give it to people and you were on my show. And what I thought, found, you know, I talk about the culture a lot. So what I found different about your book and most interesting is that you talk about important issues. Uh, and there are a lot of good books out there that covers what's going on in schools and in the culture. But when it comes to education, most of them are talk, fighting over, you know, Curriculum, the CRT books, or they're talking about, they're making it political. And you're just like, like the uh, subtitle says, a warning about the next generation. You're just saying, as a teacher who's been teaching for, you know, 40 years, I have a, okay, you're not that old, but 20 some odd years. And you're talking about the things you've seen, talking about walking in the classroom when you were a one year, two year teacher and look at now how the product you're getting in high school, sophomore, whatever year, is not the same as it was before. Something is different, and you felt that somebody needed to kind of illuminate the problem, and who better than a teacher? So I think that made the approach of the book better. It made the information more interesting, and it was important to talk about. So we're going to get into what you find that's, you know, that is a problem and why you are sounding the alarm. But why did you write the book? Well, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, Charles, I mean, I am, and I'm an absolutely unapologetic classroom romantic, right? So, you know, I, I, I talk in very glowing terms about, uh, kind of the transformation of the human mind and the human spirit, uh, when you come into contact with big ideas and important teachers and powerful, uh, decisive classroom experiences. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in the last six or seven years is that I feel like my ability to shape and to mold and to kind of evoke kind of transformations of the mind and of the spirit have really become stunted. Uh, that there's something very different with the way that young people don't just look at education. Uh, I'm talking about like, like the, I mean, I'd like to think, I know everybody wants to write a big book, but I really do feel like I'm getting to the essence of, of, of being a human being, that the basic assumptions about life and living and values and America and family and what we're supposed to be doing with this limited thing called time, like the assumptions that, that, that I made my whole life about my country, about my relationships, they don't share in that. And not only that, the way that young people spend their time radically different than the way that we spent our time uh, as young adults and as even as children. And and what really bothers me is that, you know, the term hollowed out is kind of a, I mean, it's kind of violent. I mean, you have this idea that, that we're taking uh, human beings and we're taking things out of them. And, and I'm unapologetic in saying that that's exactly right. There are things in the basic makeup of human beings uh, that, that are just missing in young people today. Uh, can be aspirations, knowledge, values, uh, and we can get into like all the different things, but the reason why I, I wrote this book was because it really is uh, an alarm bell. Uh, I'm trying to sound the alarm. And, you know, one of the things about being a teacher is you know, you're never going to be famous, right? You're never going to be rich. Um, you're never going to be any of these things. But the one thing, Charles, that you get is sometimes we get to be like Nostradamus, right? We get to be like a soothsayer. We, we see things at the Ides of March a little bit sooner than everybody else does. And I would tell you that you know, the things that I've seen, um, really, and this is so interesting, every day I, I open up the newspaper and I see studies about mental health, about birthless rates, about young people not wanting to get married, about a lack of patriotism, about not going to church. And I'm like, this is exactly what I've been talking about for years. Um, and, and now everybody else is kind of starting to catch up. So, you know, that, that's the main reason that I wrote it. Well, well, Shamika, before I get into the particulars, I want to get your high level idea just in general, like, 
Obviously, there's differences, but some people argue that there's a difference between every generation, which is true. But they are truly, we're not even talking about what happens when they get in their 20s and 30s. But I see, you know, young people as viewing things differently. Like, I know when I was a teenager, I wasn't that bright, right? And, you know, you got this, you feel you're invincible. That stuff is not new. But I think that there's always a, a switch where young people start to care about life. Like they care about in different ways and it, and it grows, but they care about life. They may not know what it means. They may not know what political party I am or how much money I want to make or what my career is going to be, but they care about things. These people seem to be excited about not knowing anything. It's like they wear it as a badge of honor, right? To not know anything. You know, it's like, why would I need to know anything? I can click on this thing right here and it shows me whatever I need to know. So I, do you sense something different, you know, just universally from an age standpoint, not necessarily race or education, just different in this next generation? I, I think his title, Hollowed Out, is just so perfect because when I think about it, I kind of think of uh, like the, these shell or this shell of a person with no soul, no spirit, like they don't have that earth or that, you know, that desire, that drive, you know, some of them, of course, still do, depending on how they were raised, but it really is like they're just going around, going through the motions, but not really feeling anything. And so that's why I was just saying prior to coming on air that I'm really excited about, you know, talking about this because I have three daughters, 16, 18, and 25, and I, I don't completely see the drive that I feel like I had at such a young age. You know, my daughter will be 26 tomorrow. At 26, I got married. And she's not really interested in it like that. You know, she's just still living her best life. <laughs> and I, I want to know exactly maybe where I went wrong as a parent. You know, sometimes you feel like I want to give them better than what I had, which is not always the, the right thing to do, because then I think you miss some of the lessons that maybe you learned coming along the way because we, we had to work for things a little bit more. I was working at 12, so, but I didn't want my kids working, like not even through college. Like, I don't want y'all working while you're in school. I want, I want you to just focus on school, but I don't know if that's quite the right thing, you know? So I'm, I don't have an answer, but I definitely noticed the difference. And so I want to just really unpack this because it's a very important topic to me. Yeah, oh, oh, first we, of all, I'm sure you well, were... Uh, before we get into... Yeah. Go ahead, Charles, I'm sorry. I'll go ahead, Jim. What I was going to say, first of all, I'm sure you're a great mother, uh, by the way, um, and, and happy birthday to your, your daughter. Don't feel bad. But, but uh, what I was going to say was that, um, you know, when you write a book like this, you know, it, it's the complaint, you know, the complaint you hear from people is, okay, boomer, go away, old man. First of all, I'm not a boomer. I'm way too young. I'm way younger than Charles. Okay. Maybe he's a boomer. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm barely a Gen Xer. Thank you very much. Uh, and, but, but when people want to bash the book, they just say, well, it's a typical old man yelling into the wind, pushing up against the ocean. Every generation does this. And my response to that is you're wrong. This is a, this, there's, this is a unique generation in a lot of bad ways that you beautifully articulated. First of all, if anybody thinks that I'm, I'm full of bull, uh, cause I'm gonna cut the bull right now, right? I would tell them this is the most uniquely unhappy generation of Americans in the history of our country. When you look at rates of suicide, when you look at rates of self harm, the word that, that I hear all the time in my classroom, guys, I mean, I, this word I hear it all the time is anxiety. Uh, our young people are constantly filled with anxiety. I'm starting to hear the word trauma all the time. So these are young people who, who, who do not feel good about their lives. And of course, the irony is uh, they are living uh, from, from an external standpoint in the best time in the history of the human species, right? We are healthier, wealthier, freer than any homo sapiens have ever existed. And yet, if you ask a young person today, they think they're living through the worst of times. And so 
my question is, what what is the reason for that chasm between how they feel about their lives and the reality of, of how good they, they truly have it in a historic sense? And so I, I guess my the big idea of Hollowed Out, right? And again, I'm, I'm not a philosopher. You know, I'm not, I, I don't teach it at Harvard. Uh, I'm not a, a world famous commentator, right? But my argument is that our young people have completely been kind of seduced into this cult of radical individualism. And because of that, they look at freedom very differently than the way you and I do. You were talking about how, you know, you know, when I was younger, you, when you were that age, you were married, you were working, you were doing all these things. And that's because you and I look at freedom as the freedom to connect ourselves to things bigger than ourselves to give our lives meaning. Love and marriage, friendship, family, faith in God, patriotism, love of country, love of community, reading, big ideas, big emotions, all of these things where we, we look at the world and we say, I believe in that. I believe in that person. I believe in that cause. I believe in that God. And I'm going to use my freedom to attach myself to a commitment to those things. That's not how young people look at freedom today. They look at it as the freedom from obligation. That when they look at how tired I am every day because my children drive me up the wall, they look at how hard marriage is and how hard it is to be a good teacher or to be a devout Christian. They're like, why would I do that? Why would I freely connect myself to things that require so much of you? And that's how they see freedom. Now, you and I both know that that's a one-way path to misery. That that's, right. you know, when you're 17 and you're not connected to anything, that's cool. When you're 40, it's pathetic. But you look at how they don't get married. They don't have kids. They're not patriotic. They don't go to church. They, they don't want to join, they don't even want to join political parties anymore. I mean, look at all the political, look at all the po political activism. As Charles knows, BLM doesn't have a leader, right? The 99% doesn't have a leader. Uh, Abolish ICE doesn't have a leader. They don't connect to anything. It's all radically individualistic. So I know I went on for a while there, but that's, that's kind of the big theory of what's hollowing them out. So Will, before we get into the specifics of what he's seeing, I wanted to get your idea of kind of like we were, I was asked, going around asking what's different about this younger generation in the sense that we all know when we're all young, we're not that bright, we think we know everything, we think we'll live forever, we, you know, we have this invincible feeling, but, and they have that, but there's something a, a, a bit different here. If you, if you notice uh, anything different, or you, what your takeaway is as to why, uh, if you think there's a difference yeah. between this young generation and others. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that every generation, literally going back to ancient Rome, if you've read their writings, has complained about the generation after it. But I also think that sometimes they're right. I mean, so if you were going to describe past generations of, say, white Americans as racist or crime, especially in our community, is a big problem during the 60s and 70s, and you were a father figure doing that, you would be correct. And I, I think Jeremy's point about the current up-and-coming generation of Americans is largely correct. I mean, empirically in political science, this point's been made. This is, by the way, I read the book. It's an excellent example of making it. But I mean, like Robert Putnam did this in Bowling Alone. This is more than a decade back now. But people are becoming more alienated, um, islandized is a word he used a couple times, but separated from one another. So uh, a couple things. First, the reviews for this book are hilarious. Um if you go to Amazon, because it's people from elder millennials to boomers that are basically agreeing, like, here's Liz Cantor, I think most of us are friendly, but Jeremy Adams demonstrates that young people today have no sense of history, no knowledge of their own damn civilization, no loyalty to their country, no love lives, no interest in reproducing, no valuable skills, no attention spans, no ambitions, no hopes. How it out becomes in the, belongs in the illustrious company of God and man at Yale and the closing of the American mind. Uh, the next review actually mentions bowling alone. So, I mean, I, I think we're getting, just looking through the book and the comments on it, we get a good summary of what it says. This, I don't think that, so I, I think this criticism is basically correct. Um, one of the most astonishing things that I read recently about young Americans is that in the era of Tinder and so on, people are having much less sex. Yeah. People are not meeting up in person to fuck, excuse the language. Like, they seem to have trouble making dates. They seem to have trouble sort of closing dates. Like, second and third dates don't have the results that they used to. Most people, when after they met their partner, will say, on the Internet. So, where does this come from? I think that it comes from the extraordinary desire of recent generations of parents to protect their kids. 
which to some extent is understandable. I mean, Shamika just broke that down a little. Jeremy just broke that down a little. But one of the things that you have to over understand is that overcoming pain and struggle is what makes you happy in life. I'm actually an extremely happy person, and I myself need to work on some things like settling down, having some kids. I mean, I'm coming to that 40 mark and don't, don't have any in the home right now. But I mean, a lot of that is because I grew up in the hood and then had this interesting life. I mean, dealing with mom's illness and going through these stages of education while working these crazy jobs to pay for them. And now I'm very happy because I live in a big house and no one's trying to fight me and my job is legal. So it's because of that contrast with things that were difficult and unpleasant in the past um, that I, I feel content today. This is true for all of us. The sort of cliche but classic example of this is the old political science canard, which in some form, again, goes back to Aristotle or Plato, but, you know, there are bad times which make strong men. You run a risk of tyrants, but this is where you get your strong people from. And they set up a peaceful, easy society. But the problem with a peaceful, easy society is that it produces the mob. It produces weak men, now women as well. So those people make very bad times, and those very bad times make strong men. And that's as true now as it was in, you know, ancient Lacedaemon. I mean, that that's that's accurate. So now we're seeing the result of this. I mean, if you never had, if you haven't done a lot of those things, you haven't been, you know, varsity athlete, you haven't been a soldier, either for real or out on the streets, you haven't, get, you haven't even gone to the state college, your parent, and if you did, you didn't live in slum-like student housing, your parents paid for an apartment for you at a private school, you know, all of this, you may not have a lot of skills, or you may not have a lot of demons that motivate you, and it might be very easy just to do the simplest thing kind of getting to the point here, rather than taking on risks. Like, when I look at my upper-middle-class female friends in their mid-to-late 30s, like, a staggering number of them have a cat or dog rather than a husband and a couple kids. Yeah. And when you ask people about this, one of the consistent explanations is it's just easier. Yeah. It, does, it doesn't take up as much of my life. I can still go to the office. I can be an executive. But I guess the question is whether something like being an HR manager is really worth replacing the things that used to give meaning to life. Working through the fights in a marriage, raising your young, going to church. So, Jeremy, I, I think this I tend to be a long talker. But this is a good summary of, the book is a good summary of a trend that we all see around us. Kids that don't know how to date and that kind of thing. Well, I want to put a final point. First, I know Jeremy, uh, he made you clutch your pearls. I told you that, uh, you know, you asked if it was PG or PG-13. Well, there you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but the sex thing you want to put a point on, because you write about it in the book, um, a couple of other people, Will mentions it all the time, but you also have to keep in mind it. So they're having less sex, but they're doing it in the time that you would think it'd be easier to do. And where all of the, the old classic kind of, um, you know, um, stick in the mud kind of uh, prudishness that used to be the norm is gone. You can pretty much outside of, you know, you know, the things that are illegal, do whatever you want to do with who, whoever you want to. We celebrate all this stuff. There's a pride of certain can I Can I say one very yeah. quick thing about this? What? I was talking to one of my uncles, uh, you know, by courtesy, but older upper middle class black man. He was talking about uh, Tinder. And Tinder, I'm sure for, I'm sure all, everyone's very aware of it, but it's a platform where you can literally log on and ask people to come over and have sex with you. Mm. Um, I was single at the start of Tinder's introduction, broke off from Grindr, found it fascinating, did reasonably well. But I mean, like, I was talking to this guy about what Tinder was, and he was like, man, if they had that when I was in college, I would have been putting up Wilt Chamberlain numbers. Yeah, I mean, I was a fraternity man, I was an athlete, and it, it just struck this older gentleman as just remarkable. Like, so you mean you can log on and I can wear, like, the, capper or whatever sweater and I could post my credentials and women would contact me and they would come over and have sex with me. And it was like, yeah, oh, that's what would happen. And, you know, they only, they only have sex like one tender date and two, you know, all that. But still, it's it, th this idea struck this guy as just fascinating because he came from an era when you had to hunt and gather. You had to go out to bars yourself, you know. And th the fascinating thing is that except for a small number of select men, People on these platforms still aren't getting laid. Well, see, that's the key point right there, Will. Did you follow up with your uncle and say, did you know? He's like, man, I'll be putting out Wilt numbers. You should have said, do you know that the guys who have um, Tinder now aren't putting up Wilt numbers? They're not even putting up your numbers. 
Well, that's, that's the point. Yeah, people, but did you tell him that? He probably would have really, really been floored in. You think, what? So you telling me this app is here and they're not having sex? I don't, I don't remember what I told him. I actually never lie on this show, but I mean, it's, it's, that's like, if you go log on to Instagram or OnlyFans or any of this stuff, it's just straight up porn. Like, it's people on all fours, like bikini pulled to the side, like, who out there wants to hang out? And guys are not doing it. It's really, really remarkable. I mean, so- yeah, so I was just wanting to jump in because I was just having a conversation. I had to actually ask on OnlyFans. No, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not on OnlyFans. But so for some reason, younger guys try to talk to me, like under forty, in their thirties, or you know, early thirties. And it seems like the conversation will be going okay, and then all of a sudden, I'll get this. uh I got come gag on it. And I'm thinking, well, if I was going to, now I'm not because now you have put in this request and I've never been with you before. So when I hear come gag on it from somebody that I've never been with sexually, I hear waste of my time because you're telling me what you want and how you can be pleased, but you haven't offered me any type of thought of pleasure by that statement, I can see like they're talking to themselves right out of the panties because if I was going to now not because you just said come gag on it. That's not a that's not a pickup line. That's something that you say to somebody that you've already been with, in my opinion, that can then fill in the blanks. I can't fill in or the blanks. Or somebody you're paying. I don't even right. say that. <laughs> Actually, there's something more important. It's what you'd say in like eighth grade when you think that's how cool people talk about sex. Like, hey, bitch, you trying to come over? I mean, the, the adult ver- the adult version would be something like, hey, do you want to come over to my place and drink some wine or chill? Like, right. you, know, like movie. you know what's going to happen it's unless you have absolutely no game. But no gentleman is going to tell a woman like, hey, you want to come over and on this date? Because it's going to be... This is this isn't one of my more eloquent shows, but I mean, it, this is it's just that's <laughs> not going to work. But the thing is, it's it's important not just to look at the crudity of all of this. It's important to look at kind of the lack of training involved, and it gets back to the same point Jeremy's making. Like some girl that's just taking a picture of their ass with no face attached and posting it on the internet doesn't really know a lot about how to talk to guys either. And that's why most of the people on Tinder, many of the women, seem to wind up with the same 20 bums. There are people who do have game that professionally take advantage of that. Like the Tinder swindler thing was amazing to me. This guy who got thousands of women or whatever it was to give him money as well as sex. And it's because of the lack of normal communication, the lack of awkward encounters and bars and goofy first kisses out behind a Greek house and so on. And that's Jerry. Uh, all that to you. Well, first of all, let me just say that my high school students have really gotten a kick when I get on shows, you know, with a national audience. And so oftentimes I'll tell them, you want to go, you know, you want to see I was on Fox News or, you know, you want to check out this podcast. Uh, I hope you guys are not offended if I don't send them. Uh, to, 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 to listen to this specific one. Uh, just, just hope you guys aren't offended by that. Um, uh, but, but I thought that you'd be running to tell them about this yeah. one. Uh, no, but, but okay. you know what though? But the point though, and, and, and Will just made like, he got to the, to the point I'm trying to make there in the very end, which is that the problem is, you know, it, it's like, you guys remember the, I think it's the Roman god Giannis, the one who has two, two faces, right? And on one face, you kind of have this, uh, like licentious, tender, uh, let's just do whatever we want to do and no consequences, uh, that we're going to completely divorce sexuality from sentimentality, uh, that there, none of that. It's, it's just pure animalistic. And of course, you know, I'm, you know, I consider myself to be a practicing Christian, which I don't like it because I think it completely perverts human sexuality and makes it completely, again, my, back to my theory about radical individualism, uh, when you, when you kind of go into this licentious worldview of sexuality, once again, it's all about you. Uh, somebody who's sending you gross messages like that, it's not about you, it's about them over and over and over again. Um, and, and what I would say is, is that this really is truly just a symptom, right? And we saw this a little bit in the 1990s with the Japanese, people who had no interest in sexual behavior. But you also see it today. I mean, you see kind of famous headlines where people say, you know, uh, too much Netflix, not enough chill, right? And so you see 
uh, the, these people in their 20s, and Charles made a great point. When it comes to kind of cultural um, uh, morality, when it comes to any kind of a uh, norm, we don't have any norms anymore, right? Unless you're talking about age or consent, there is no norm. But I think Will got to the essence of it, which is that the problem with sexuality for these young people is the fact that they don't know how to connect, right? It's it's awkward. So that when they do connect, it's a very quick, momentary, you know, I don't, I'm not too quick, but, you know, the, you know, one interaction and they leave because the intimacy, having to talk to somebody, having to get to know somebody. I mean, this is, to me, it's the same reason why not only do they not date, but they also, they don't go out to football games, right? They, they don't go out to the movies. And, and when you ask them why, I mean, I, my high school, Bakersfield High School, big football school. I mean, we have more state champions than championships than anybody else in California. Now, most of this happened in the 1920s. We won't mention that too much. But, you know, you go to a football game on a Friday night if you are a student at my high school. And I've noticed that in the last few years, nobody's going out. Nobody's going to the football games. And I, I'll say to the students, where are you? Like, what are you doing on a Friday night? And they say some interesting things that kind of go along with this kind of lack, lack of sexual interest. The first thing they say is, Mr. Adams, I'm still hanging out with my friends. I'm just doing it by myself in my room in the dark on my phone, right? And we all know that that's a joke, right? We all know that that doesn't feel the same as sitting there, standing in the stands, yelling for your team, doing a dance, you know, do it, rushing the field. It's not the same. The second thing they say, I think is really interesting. They say, you know, I really don't want to go to a football game, Mr. Adams, because I might have to interact with people and not know how to talk to them. And it's awkward. I don't know how to talk to people. Like, do a thought experiment for a minute, my friends. Imagine if you were an alien, right? And you came here 15 years ago and you watched Americans uh, talk to each other and interact, right? Then you come today. You would see these devices have radically changed what they do with their free time. So as an example, it used to be if I ended class four or five minutes early, man, talk, 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 gossip, 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 flirt, flirt, flirt you know, running around, all this nervous energy. Nowadays, if I say, okay, guys, you know, we finished up. I don't want to, you know, don't want to start the new thing. Two or three minutes left. Do whatever you want. Silence. Absolute silence. They don't engage each other. And I think that that, that is the broader problem here, uh, is that when they do participate in sexual behavior, they don't want to, you know, they don't want it to last because that gets messy. Having to know another human being. I don't know about you guys. But the older I get, the more I feel broken, the more I feel like I don't know a lot, the more kind of humility I feel. Uh, you know, Will talked about Aristotle. You know, Aristotle said the purpose of life is not merely to live, but to live well. And I feel like I knew how to do that better sometimes 20 years ago when I knew everything because I was young. And now I really have this posture of humility. And, and, and that's what it means to engage the world, is to not be sure of yourself, is to be broken, is to have to love people who are imperfect. And that's hard. And they don't want to do that. And it's not safe. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, I'll go ahead, Shanika. Oh, no, I was going to say, I hear my, my girls and other kids say all the time, I don't have any friends. Yeah. And I'm thinking when I was that age, I was very social. Like, okay, maybe I didn't have real friends, but there were tons of people that I called friends that I thought were friends that I would hang out with and have a good time with. And they just, you know, like, I don't have any friends. And I'm like, how? You go to school with kids. All day, every day. I don't, I don't get it. Well, but well, listening to you is like, okay, that makes perfect sense. What's happening? Well, they, they don't know. I mean, that's the thing. Is like, is that they're also like, I've noticed a lack of, of a problem with eye contact. Like, they don't look you in the eye. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. I really believe the masking in the last two years yeah. has it, it is it is doubled down on all of this isolation and 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 all of the, the inability to kind of read a face, the ability to engage. Um, and and, and it, it's a skill, like, I guess it's something as a teacher, I didn't really appreciate, like to me, as somebody who loves his job, like I'm, I've never considered myself a writer who teaches. I'm a teacher who writes. Um, and and that, that's my primary focus is being a teacher. And I never realized and appreciated how much joy I got by just reading faces. Like I, you know, I'm in the classroom and, and I know some of you guys are too sometimes, and like, I need to know, are you laughing at my joke? Are you confused by what I'm teaching? Are you inspired by what I'm teaching? Are you pissed off by what I'm teaching? I need to know that. And young people don't know how to give that anymore. And friendship. I mean, you know, you talked about how you had friends when you were a lot of friends. So did I. Did you know that one out of five millennials, one out of five millennials say they don't have a good friend in the entire world? That's 20%. 
when you look at loneliness, levels of loneliness, it's interesting throughout American history, the lonely people are always the old people, right? It's the elderly who, you know, their, their, their children are busy, their grandchildren don't talk to them. They feel lonely. I don't know what it says, but the loneliest young people, people nowadays are young people. Teenage girls. Remember what Facebook came out with talking about how Instagram makes young people feel so isolated, so lonely, so cut off. Because loneliness is not about being alone. It's about feeling that you're not participating in meaningful activities with other human beings. Well, they don't, they don't do that. No wonder they're so damn lonely. And so I, I, I completely echo what, what you're saying. Well, well, isn't another problem? I mean, you talk about, you mentioned a couple of the sex, the friendships, the, uh, the, the adulthood, you know? Yeah. Put, put, putting off being adults and all that kind of stuff. And we kind of like try to figure out why these things are happening. And part of it is, like Will said, prior gener generations have always said these things about other generations. We always like all oh, that old man, like, why listen? But then we also turn, get into our thirties and like, man, my father used to say that. Yeah, I should have listened, right? We remember it. Mm -hmm. But the problem here may, seems to be, here's another level of the problem in that, you know, if you have a great relationship with your, uh, your parents or a mentor or something, you try to emulate them or you meet some teacher or somebody who inspires you. Well, now we have a situation where these people tend not to have that close contact with family anymore. The yeah. family isn't as close as they used to be. Whether their two parents are home or not, they don't eat dinner anymore. You write about one of the things I felt found most fascinating about your book was these types of nuggets. So you write about how you start off teaching and you would talk about politics and everybody else would focus on the political thing, but you found something uh, deeper, which I liked. So they were like, well, I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat because my dad says, you know, taxes high. My dad, mom says taxes low and people get caught up in where well, your parent must be this p political leaning. But no, the issue is you notice that they never said that stuff anymore. And you've thought about it like, hold on, why, why are you not telling me what mom and dad thinks about these political issues? And you found out it's because either mom or dad's not there, single family, or even when the parents are there working uh, long hours, that they didn't talk about these things anymore. They're not at the dinner table or whatever. So they, didn't say, they don't say that my dad thinks this because dad doesn't tell him what he thinks. So that also makes it harder. You, 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 you know, your generation is different. The devices are there and now no one's talking to you. So even if I wanted to, to, to live like my dad and watch him and follow him and emulate him, I can't because he's not around. Charles, that, that is a, a brilliant point. And, and, and one of the things I really want people to understand who are listening to the podcast is, you know, there's so many things that make this generation unique, but really maybe the biggest one is that young people today, that kind of connective tissue, that puts young people in the space, the physical, the moral, the intellectual space of adults is simply not there for this generation, right? And, and COVID definitely doubled down on that for sure. Um, is that, is that, you know, we don't eat as a, as, as, as a family, we don't eat dinner together. I mean, when you think about it this way, you know, for most of human history, when a young person wanted to figure out how to live their lives, when they wanted answers to what, you know, what Dostoevsky called the eternal questions about being a human being, where would they turn? Well, they would turn to a mom or a dad or a pastor uh, or, or, or a friend or a mentor or a grandparent. And the reason for that is because adults were seen as kind of being living, breathing depositories of human wisdom, right? Because we've been there. We, we, none of Adults know that none of us get out of this alive. All of us are broken. The slings and the arrows of life, the disappointments, the pains, the cancer, the lost loves, the unfulfilled ambitions, it's real. It's there. And let me tell you, kid, about it. And the problem is if young people are not in the space of those people who are older, then we're not communicating those values and those perspectives. And so who do young people hang out with all day? Who do they listen to all day? Each other. I mean, we have, we have completely fetishized childhood. So children listen to other children all day, watch their videos, watch their TikToks, right? Watch their values. So they keep absorbing what other kids think and there's no adults around. You know, and the other thing I would say, to kind of double down on what Charles was saying there, uh, is that, and this is right now, I mean, this has become so obvious this year, guys. Like, what's different in the classroom now, post-COVID? God, I hope we can say it's post. But, but, but now, I'll tell you right now what's very clear. What's very clear to me is that we know, you know, the expectation of teaching today and learning in the classroom is no longer to kind of evoke a kind of transformation within children. Right. You know, I think Will talked about the importance of grit and, and difficulty and, and the hurdles of life make it meaningful. Right? A little Nietzsche in there about, you know, if it doesn't break you, it makes you stronger. 
that is that is absolutely not what casting is supposed to be nowadays. Now they are like we're, we're, we're part friend, we're part therapist, we're part a parent. We're there to make their lives as comfortable and easy and empathetic as possible. So the, the, the purpose of the classroom is to, is to make the world very easy for them so that they feel accepted and good about themselves as if self-esteem has ever rocked the cradle of achievement. But that's the value system instead of saying, no, you need to know things. You need to get smarter. You need to work harder. You need to have an education. You need to be able to read and write and communicate. You need to be able to change. Now we expect the world to change around our kids. And let me tell you, it's creating a profound sense of entitlement and it's making them weak as hell. That is so true. I remember the first time I kind of noticed this was happening. I think my one of my children may have been in like third grade or something and they were having field day and they did tug of war. And when the one side won, they started, you know, cheering because they were happy the teacher said no 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 stop cheering like no you can't do that because you can't make the other side feel bad and i'm thinking oh my god like they should be cheering and the other side should feel bad they lost <laughs> you right. know but it was like they didn't want the other side to get down or feel sad and i'm like I played tug of war my entire elementary school, you know, and sometimes we lost and they cheered and that's just what it is. You got over it. But now they don't want to do that. And of course, giving them the participation trophies just because they participated in something. And I'm like, this is really starting to, to be really bad. Right. And I noticed that the schools are definitely part of the problem, in, you know, regardless of the intent if what you're doing is causing harm, it's causing harm, you know, and it's little things like obviously we have this argument going on in the country now about what they're teaching and all that kind of stuff, which we all have an opinion on that, but it's other stuff like, so one of the pushes is to teach social emotional learning, right? Mm -hmm. Again, like we talked before about, you can get into the political debate, but I wanted to talk about how the parents weren't talking to the kids anymore. So we can talk about how, whether SEL is good or bad. Or how to do it the right way, the wrong way. Here's what you might find in interesting, uh, Jeremy. My son's in first grade. And for the last three days, he came home and I'm like, well, what'd you do in class? He's like, well, math, the reading, my dog stuff. So he talks about it. Not, and I don't mean he talks about it's good or bad. Or this is what we learned. So it's not like he's describing something they did in class. And I was like, oh, that must be social emotional learning. No, no. My six year old is saying, well, we did social emotional learning today. So why does he need to know the term? Even if you're teaching under that veil, if you sit around with other teachers saying, well, we want to infuse this type of education. We want to use this. That's one thing. But he is coming home talking in their language, right? He's talking in their diversity, SEL kind of language. He said, well, it's social emotional learning. We did this. And I'm like, well, how is that helpful, right? So I don't, I'm not as concerned about it, you know, but you know, you can't always, because parents, if they're good parents, I always think, well, you know, some of them make the mistake of saying it's no big deal because I'm a good parent and I can correct this. But not if it's a, a nonstop onslaught of it coming from every direction and the other kids are talking about it. So I even found that fascinating. I'm like, wow, why, is, why are they telling him that he's doing social-emotional learning? It seems weird. Yeah, you know what I'm waiting for? And I'm waiting for somebody to have some real courage and, and do a deep dive into this. Um, and that is, you know, what's interesting to me is like, what kind of teachers are the popular teachers for this generation? And it's, it's, it's changed. And, and I know maybe, maybe it's because I used to be a popular teacher and now I'm not. Maybe I'm just kind of bitter about it, you know, but, but, but I'll tell you, you know, when I was younger and even when I was a younger teacher, the things that really imbued young people with a sense of an impression was somebody who could razzle and dazzle in the classroom, somebody who had a, an encyclopedic command of their, of their, of their subject, somebody who had great passion. For learning, somebody who can make a strong connection to the students, uh, somebody who could conduct a Socratic dialogue, right? Um, these were very impressive things to the young people. And what I find nowadays is that what what what, what really shines in the classroom is not a bunch of pedagogic uh, alon, right? Well, what really shines is is activism. Uh, it's kind of having the white perspective. Uh, it's I'm you know I'm going to be an advocate for this or that. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, I don't want my teachers advocating. I want them teaching. Um, and, and that kind of bothers me a little bit because I've noticed that it's really hard to impress 
young teacher, uh, young, young, young students. It's much harder. Again, maybe I'm just not as funny as I used to be. Maybe I'm not as engaging as I used to be. But the things that I used to be able to do to impress them, which is, you know, I feel like I have a, 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 an unusually deep knowledge of, of American history and, 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 and American constitutionalism, it doesn't really impress them much anymore. That doesn't impress them at all. Um, the things that impress them tend to be, I think, a little bit more artificial. Uh, and, and Charles, to your point about, you know, talking to kids, there was a famous study a few years ago about what do you think would be the most important variable in predicting a child's academic success? And they, the, the, the hypothesis was that parents who volunteer at the school, and I, I've never really done this, so this made me feel good, but parents who are like volunteer at the school, the PTA and all that, that their kids would do better in school than, than, than children whose parents don't. And in fact, they found that not to be true at all. That what they found was as long as you're talking to your kid, and it doesn't matter what they're talking about, right? Like my son, I get tired of it, but he loves talking about the Rams and how they won the Super Bowl and dad, are they going to repeat? Uh, you know, and he loves talking about it. So I talk to him. That's the most important thing is that engagement. We don't have to put a label on it. It's just that kind of emotional, intellectual connection between an adult and a child is what essentially cultivates a sense of, of what adulthood looks like. Um, and, and, and that's something that I think is, is really missing from the equation uh, today. Will, anything to add? Uh, not, not too much, really. I mean, I, I do think that, that that's interesting, what Jeremy said about the teachers that kind of younger millennials seek out. And that, that's actually kind of problematic for uh, sort of secondary education. We see this in college, too. But this, this is something that's actually been an issue for kind of a while. If you go back to, like, Martin Gross writing in 1998 from the right and so on. Like, the desire of teachers to be something other than teachers. So teaching is thought of as kind of this cool but mundane middle class job. You go in there and you, you have to teach these little bastards math and, you know, every, it's the same thing every year. Is this, is this the best use of my talents? So, I mean, that particular book, which is legitimately hilarious, goes into all of the attempts by teachers to make teaching something other than teaching and communicating this information. So there was like the whole set of the first wave of sex ed back in like the late 1990s. It's okay to be gay. There were anti-bullying campaigns. There was sort of the, you know, the initial stage of wokeness that Roger Kimball and those people made fun of. But anyway, it sounds like the same thing now. Like we're now seeing another one of these quote unquote reckonings after, you know, Michael Brown and George Floyd and so on. So I'm not surprised that the teachers that are getting the most attention, that are going for awards and that the kids seem to like, are just sort of the teachers that bring the most woke crap into the classroom and spend maybe the least time on discussing U.S. history or something like that. And it's almost sort of a faculty-student non-aggression pact, right? Like in this room, we're going to talk about America, and we're going to talk about the gender you identify with, and so on down the line, and how society can be made better, and maybe we're not going to do quite as many complex fractions. And every time I've swung toward this myself, I found the kids loved it, um, they didn't learn anything, but they thought it was great. So, so it's an eternal temptation. Well, I think this is a perfect segue into the last thing I want to bring up from the book. And that is, you know, you talk about teachers and activists, activism and them being the most popular teachers. Well, you are a um, government and civics teacher. So obviously these popular teachers are making these people want to rise up and act. But I you know, call me crazy. But I always thought, and I don't even begrudge people for being activists, but I always thought they kind of needed to know the basics and the foundation, and they needed to know what they were against cold. So they, they were able to argue against the counterpoint so they understand it. That's totally fine. What we're seeing is a bunch of people who know nothing, who are mad about something but don't know what it is, and they're like, well, you know, so they scream about a policy and they're mad about mad at a guy for that policy. And that guy has nothing to do with the policy because they don't know government and civics. So talk a bit about what I would assume would be your struggles. And I don't know, because you were also teaching AP. So I'm assuming your people knew a lot of stuff that, you know, that now we got this big, you know, umbrella of um, activism. You're under this cloud of activism, but the people don't understand the foundation that they need to understand to be great citizens, to be great people, and to even push back against the government if they want to do that. Yeah, well, I mean, for two things I'd say about that. Number one is I do think that outrage uh, has replaced knowledge as the marker of interest for a lot of people. 
Uh, I think being outraged or offended seems to imbue a sense of authority uh, that it didn't before. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, one of, I think, I'll tell you where I think we went off the track, largely, is, is from a traditional standpoint, um, you know, what gives a human being authority? What, you have authority because of what you know and what you've experienced and what you've achieved. Uh, and that gives you a sense of, 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 of gravitas, a, a sense of kind of intellectual and moral fortitude. And I think when we told the kids that you, you don't really have to know anything to be an authority. You don't really have to, you don't have to have like gone out and marched against anything or know your facts. You just need to be outraged. You just need to be pissed off. You just need to somehow claim that you're a victim of something and that some kind of impersonal force is to blame for it. And now you have authority behind it. And I, and I think that young people are smart and they, they know that. And they, you know, you tell them that everything, every flipping thing in the world is about power, right? Then they're going to be thinking in terms of, well, then how do I get it? Uh, and I, I, I need to interrupt you. I know you're a role, but I would like yeah. to hear you and Shamika give me a response to this. Give you a great example. So I'm watching the news the other day. And my wife usually doesn't comment on this stuff, but even her, she turned is like, is this real? So there is a play in New York new that's coming up. Uh, I know it's an opera. It's about Emmett Till. So it is written by a, a, a Two older women who were alive when he, when he was, uh, um, lynched. So you know their role. White woman and a black woman. The woman did the music. The black, the white woman wrote the, the scenes or whatever. And so it's all about him. It's great. It's supposed to be uplifted. It's, you watch the clip. You see black, you know, a d diverse group of people playing. There's a black woman singing. It's everything you want. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> it's like an inherently depressing topic to me. Not the topic. The fact that they're, they're getting what they want, right? They're talking about the type of thing they want, race. They're doing it in, a, in, in an enlightening sense. It's not making fun of them, anything like that. It's very diverse. It's everything these big woke people want. But there's a protest with like 8,000 signatures to stop the play. And I didn't know until the local news did a story about it that these people were women and a black woman, whatever. And the reason they want to stop it is because they said, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're profiting off of some poor kid who died, his mother's dead, and it's just some white woman trying to, to, you know, put her white guilt at ease, right? It ignore which one, it ignores the black woman is fifty percent of the show. But the pe the spokesperson of the people getting the signatures was this young teenage girl. Right? And she was like, Well, I'm offended because of this and I don't think it's right and I will not stand for you making money off of Emmett Till. And my wife was like, Who made her the authority? She's like fourteen. Who even asked her? But the media put her out there put it behind a podium and stuck a microphone in her face and I want to know what you think. I want to know why you think this opera should not go on. What do you think about that? That that's the person who the everybody turned to to tell us, tell the adults, these these people who were alive when he was lynched and they felt moved enough to, to, to do this that no, you're wrong about this and you need to cut it out. Well, I mean, this is what we've done. This, right? We've really like get, given authority to, to, to young people. I mean, what is the name of the, the climate activist, Greta? Greta Thunberg. Oh, Greta Thunberg. That's exactly what I was going to say. This is very common. Yeah, it, it, it's the same. And it's not just climate anymore. They go to her about anything. Yeah, or, or that you know, like, like they always say, well, like you know, young people are cutting edge. They 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 get it. They understand things in a way that you don't because you've existed in a paradigm that 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 that. Uh, they didn't have to live in. So they see things. It's, you know, I had an intelligent kid once, actually. I mean, it was pretty clever. He's like, you know, Mr. Adams, uh, the greatest mathematicians and physicists are always in their 20s. Uh, when, when, when Newton was doing his great work, uh, on the three laws of motion and thermodynamics, he was in his 20s. And Einstein in 1905 was in his 20s, you know, because they don't, they haven't had to buy into the paradigm that other people, uh, kind of bought into, which I thought, okay, that, that's a clever argument. But, but, you know, to me, you know, the, the real problem here is, again, this sounds simple, and I, I know you, people probably tune in to this podcast for very erudite, profound ideas, and, you know, I, I see the list of people who've been on this podcast, uh, and, and I feel kind of lowly as a result, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a 1.0 explanation. Young people don't know much. Like, like the knowledge that they have, like what you expect, a 15 or 16 or 17 year old, a bright, bright American to know. They literally don't know. Anybody who's read the book knows my book starts off with what I do the first day of my political science classes, right? I, I project a picture of a celebrity, you know, like, you know, like, like one of the uh, Kardashians. Everybody knows them. And then you put Nancy Pelosi. I know you guys probably don't want to know Nancy Pelosi, but, but, you know, but you at least know who she is, right? You know, she's the speaker of the house. And, and so, you know, like, let me give you an example from two days ago. Two days ago, right? I teach an advanced world history class. 
and I'm trying to make some point. I don't remember what it was about. And I said, okay, so, so for instance, as an example, who did America declare its independence from? Silence. I said, guys, come on. I mean, this is not, this is not hard. Who did America declare its independence from? Who was Jefferson writing to? Okay, silence. Then I finally said, okay, what language, what language do we speak? And this one kid's like, oh, I got it. Spain. No joke. I mean, it, it is shocking. Uh, even, I mean, even things that are not political, Charles. Like, 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 what is a day? Like, what is a day? Like, literally not knowing that a day is when the earth goes around on its axis one time. What's a year? You're going around the sun. Like, they don't know basic things. And I think people who are not in the classroom would be shocked by how much they don't know. So, it's, so you're, when you're trying to scaffold and teach advanced government, it, it, you're starting right from square one. Yeah, I'm in one of my classes. I have a basic sort of test of where different stuff came from, like where the Industrial Revolution happened. Mm -hmm. And the four options are England, like France, Spain, for kind of the same reason your kid said this. It's sort of, you know, an alternative of the same continent. And then Egypt. And maybe because this is a historically black college, but like 15% of the people every time will say Egypt. Like, the, uh, these cultural phenomena began there because everything began in the motherland. And it's a classic example of just sort of people intelligently guessing without knowing at all. Like, okay, I'm going to assume this, but I have no no baseline of information on this sort of, did the Romans come before the Greek stuff? Oh. And just, like, uh, one quick point there. I mean, when, when you said that the kid argued that the best physicists and all this come up with their, their greatest ideas in their early 20s and so on, not really. That's when they come up with their first ideas. Yeah. So there, there actually is a point there that you need to be young and reasonably unfettered. You can't just be an establishment stooge if you want to say something brilliant. That's also when you're going to have the best sex and write the best poetry and run the fastest. But the stuff that Einstein wrote or Thomas Sowell or Milton Friedman, look at how they look on the covers of their books. Like they're gray-haired, dignified men because they didn't stop writing when they were 21. That was just their first and second best idea. So there, there's a truth to that, but then you draw out that paradigm that becomes, you know, Friedmanite economics. You talk about it your whole life. Kids don't know a lot. The other thing with critical theory, when you talk about there's a lot of critical theory in the schools, this really is a one-sentence critique. The problem with knowing critical theory is that you also need to know what you're criticizing. And I find that a lot of kids don't. Like when you say we fought the Revolutionary War against England, because we wanted a democratic or a republican alternative to this brutal monarchy. If people don't know that, when they hear critiques of modern democracy, those critiques can be perfectly valid. They can come from the communist side or something like that. But these people aren't going to know that this was considered the best of the options against monarchy, against socialism, for hundreds of years, because they don't know anything. They don't know the theory that's being criticized. Feminists are especially guilty of this in my in this regard, like critiquing patriarchy and so on. But what's the justification for the social order that we had for all these years? Why are there separate men's and women's sports? Now a lot of people are finding out, kind of rude with people. <laughs> now I want to get that was a lot there. I want to ask you, Mika, but I, but I was going to ask you, Will, you, you when you gave your uh, your your question to find out what they know, and you said maybe it's because it's an HBCU, they all say Egypt. Is that because they think that, uh, that that everybody in Egypt was black? Well, yeah, I mean, so, like, first of all, that that's another thing. And now, actually, like, the black Egyptians thing is often presented, like, arguing with, like, dissident right guys online is a complete joke. There, there were black pharaohs in Egypt in different periods. Yeah. No, but I mean, so, like, it may be that some of it, but I'm, I'm actually giving the kids credit here. I'm saying because it's a black school among, like, decently ranked schools, like, maybe they're more inclined to say something so asinine because they want to big up black Africa. Like, when a white kid in class says that, I'm a little more inclined just to fail him. Because, I mean, there's, there's not the same excuse. Like, you, you should have said Norway if you wanted to give an incoherent wrong answer. But, I mean... Yeah, it's, I, I do assume, but that, that's another example, like, and I, Jeremy would probably testify to this, you guys have both been in the classroom, but if you ask people the most basic facts, I'm actually a big fan of kind of rote phonics method, learn the mm -hmm. facts mm -hmm. instruction, like what are the capitals of the state? Yep. There's a big place for that. If you ever plan on working in sales, any kind of business driving across this country, there, there are things you need to know. But anyway, like, if you ask people the basic, most basic sort of things, like did the Greeks... Who came first? A question I've asked. 
the Greeks, the Romans, or the Egyptians? What can people answer that? Who came first, the Greeks or the Romans? Can people answer that? Uh, very often, no. Forty to fifty percent, no. Even at a pretty good school. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do kind of like a corollary will to that that I think is kind of upsetting. Where you go up there and you, you write down four presidents, right? So you write, you know, you write like Lincoln, Madison, Obama, Taft. And I say, okay, guys, put them in order: one, two, three, four. Man, I mean, they, there's no, they are all over the place uh, as far as far as what they know. Um, and, and I, I also want to kind of piggyback on what you're saying. You know, there's nothing wrong with rote. Like, I don't know when we, we got to this idea that you don't really ever need to know anything as long as you can kind of just kind of, uh, you know, think properly or, I mean, that's my problem with education now is that it's all these kind of weird, kind of very broad, amorphous skill sets. Like, kids don't need to know math. They don't need to know how to write. They don't need to know the state capitals. They don't need to know the founding fathers. They don't need to know the 14th Amendment. They don't need to know important clauses. They just need to be able to be uh, adaptive. They need to be able to have communication skills. They need to be able to, you know, uh, have technology and, 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 and know how to use it. Like, and to me, there's nothing wrong with hard knowledge and hard skills. And that's one of the things I think we've, we've really gotten away from. So yeah, I, I completely agree. We, we should stop bemoaning, uh, the, the, the fact that, yeah, there's some things you just have to memorize. You just have to know. Shamika, before I, my last thing is just going to be to ask him, um, what we can do about it is to stop this train from going that further down the track. But if the, you want to add anything about the last couple of things they mentioned. I'm still trying to figure out how do you make a musical out of Emmett Till? Opera. Like, how do you, is Opera. That Opera. Like, Opera. Oh my God, he looked at me. What nigger? No, you didn't. Oh my God, they're lying. Like, how do you... <laughs> How do you make a musical? Oh, I just said I was trapped in the closet. I just don't understand. <laughs> How do you do that? For something I don't, I don't get it. Jeremy, what, is, <clears throat> what do we do about this generation? <laughs> so you're not going to show this to your classes, what you're saying? Uh, no, 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 I probably won't. Uh, again, you know, I. I you know, there may be been some other podcasts, and, uh, but, but uh, uh, that being said, though, no, just really quickly, uh, I mean, I think, first of all, it's a great question. I never love it, though, because th there's not an easy answer. I mean, I think people want kind of like an easy hit, like, okay, here's a here's a four-plank plan towards saving. That's what I expect. Yeah, G Gen Z. You know what? And it, here's the thing. It's, it's like, frankly, um, for those of us who are parents, there are no easy answers. Um, I would say a few broad things. Number one, I think just we, as adults – we have to put ourselves back into the spaces of the kids. And that means a lot of things. We've got to take away the damn phones. We've got to take them away. Don't let them have their phones on in the classroom. Don't let them have their phones on at dinner. Don't let them have earbuds. Like, like they don't, don't, don't let them have uh, uh, earbuds in their, in their ears in the middle of class. I got into a fight with my daughter. And I'm going to tell you this and to, you know, millions of people who listen to your podcast because I know she won't be one of them. But we actually had a fight where I said, you cannot be listening to music in the middle of class. You can't focus. And it's rude. It's rude. Stop doing it. Your teacher wants your attention. And she actually was arguing with me. So we as adults, we have got to put ourselves back into the spaces. We've got to model adulthood. We've, and by the way, let's defend without, without reservation or without uh, apology, the virtues of adulthood, that, that it's good to be an adult. It's good to have uh, a nuanced view of the world. It's good to fight and to struggle and to have difficulties. So that's number one, Charles, is it, it, just we have to be, we have to model adulthood again. The second thing, um, and I say this as a civics teacher, somebody who taught political science for almost a quarter of a century, we have to tell our young people that you can love your country without admitting that it's perfect, right? A lot of young people think that, that in, if you don't, if you think that your country, if you love your country, then what you're really saying is we're perfect and we have a perfect history. And to me, this is where the whole CRT 1619 thing misses the point. You know, a lot of young people want to look at the worst parts of America and say, well, the problem is most Americans don't know about these awful parts of America. And that is the true America. The awful, you know, is it 1619 or is it 1776 or is it 1865 or 16 or 1964? What's the real America? And I think we have to t t teach our young people that the real America is evolving, that America is not, that it's fluid, that it's not just who we were, but who we became. And I think that's why, Charles, when the research is pretty clear on this, Young people aren't patriotic because when they think of what is America, they think of the worst things we ever did. And there's a lot of bad crap. There's a lot of bad things we did. Whereas you look at older Americans and you say, well, why are you so patriotic? And they will say, 
Well, look at where we were and look what we've done, right? The real America is not slavery. It's the 14th Amendment. It's not Jim Crow. It's the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the 24th Amendment. The real America is not what we did. It's what we did with what we did. That's the real America. And that spirit, that idea, that constant evolving idea that, you know, we're not going to be a perfect people. people. We're trying to become a more perfect union, right? Uh, and, and that idea is, is important to ingrain in our young people when it comes to kind of renewing the blessings uh, of this country, in my opinion. Well, he is Jeremy Adams. There's the book, author of Hollowed Out, a warning about America's next generation. Jeremy, thank you for joining us. Uh, great having you, and please play this podcast in your classroom. No, no, in the auditorium at your high school. Thank you so much, guys. It was really an honor. I mean that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.